Welcome to this session of the Center for the Economics of the Internet. Uh, it's our very great pleasure today to have with us uh, former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General James Cartwright. Uh, before he begins his presentation, let me just uh, remind you of a couple of upcoming events. Uh, next Wednesday, February 22nd, Professor Thomas Hazlett George Mason University will be speaking about uh, the future of broadcast spectrum. Uh, the first week of March, I believe it's March 7th, David Rifkin, who's a frequent contributor to the Wall Street Journal, uh, will be speaking about a topic to be determined, but quite likely the Patriot Act. Uh, but let me, uh, let us uh, dive into our program today. Uh, on uh, cybersecurity and cyber warfare, uh, General James Cartwright uh, has had a distinguished career in the United States Marine Corps, uh, rising to Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He is widely recognized as one of the world's leading experts on cybersecurity and cyber warfare. Uh, it's a very great honor for the Hudson Institute to have General Cartwright speak to us today. With that, General Cartwright. Thank you. Do I have this? Uh, you know, I, I thought a little bit about this crowd and, and maybe what you'd like to hear and then what I'd like to tell you and whether the two are even close to get together. Um, but uh, most, most of the time when I, when I have these conversations, I generally find that the underlying assumptions of how the department's organized, how we think about cyber, those types of things are not well understood. And so what I thought I would do is walk through a little bit about how that has come to be, where we started, where we are now, where I think we're likely, the department will likely head. And then on, on that context, we can do Q&A and you can go any place you want to go and, and, and I'd be happy to, to talk about uh, whatever I, I can with you. Um, you know, I, there is, uh, in context, uh, you know, the reality of, of a nation that's been at war for 10 years and that, that that warfare over that 10 years has morphed. It has, you know, it has undergone changes. Uh, we came out of the Cold War, uh, at least by act, not necessarily by intent. In other words, most of what we had in the Cold War, we still have. Most of the thinking that we had in the Cold War from a strategy standpoint still exists. But that's true also as a nation from the standpoint that you know, we started as an agrarian society, civil war generally thought of as a transition to an industrial society. Through that transition, even though we had a war, uh, we generally kept the basis of law, which is property, you know, and that that, that was not really challenged. Some of what was challenged was who, who had the authority to do what and saw a migration of authority from the states to the nation to the national government to allow the vertical infrastructure and, and industry to, to flourish in a way that, that advantaged this country. Fast forward to now, and we've entered into the information age, good enough that we haven't had a civil war to do that. But property in, 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 in the information age is a bit of a challenging construct to convert. And so law tends to be a little bit hard to, to work your way through. And of course, Anything that's new, you know, everybody wants to name it after themselves. And then as soon as they do that, they want a whole new set of laws and, and organizational constructs for that particular novelty, whatever it is. Now, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that the information age, the networks, the Internet is not a fad. I mean, it's here and, it's, and, it, and it has a significant impact on our economy, on our society. And it has really brought us more to a global society than, a, than an aggregation of, na of nation states. Where that will take us over time and the tensions that will put are, you know, are, are things that your crystal ball is as good as mine to, to figure out. But the reality is it's here. It's, it is difficult to work in the um, cyber sphere, whatever we, we want to call it, um, under the constructs of uh, patent law where you think whatever you invent is good for 20 years, and yet you've got Moore's Law sitting out there with 18-month cycles. In this 10 years of war, one thing that we have learned is that, for the most part, 
many of our fights really don't don't go on that way. Competitive advantage in these conflicts has not been something that lasts for 20 years. Um, you build an IED, I build a counter, you build a new IED, that's a 30-day cycle. That's about a 30-day cycle. We've got to come up with the counters every 30 days to stay in that fight. The cyber side of this, these fights in Iraq and Afghanistan has been turning in somewhere between 9 and, and 14 days. Um, and, and, and that's a challenging activity when you apply it against laws, rules, acquisition policies, etc., that were really designed to build aircraft carriers or tanks or whatever. It just doesn't fit. Uh, a lot of, on the economic side, um, in both the Bush administration and this administration, you know, almost a dirty word was, was really, uh, and we kept changing the name of these supplemental funds that we would get incrementally through the year at the mid part of the year, and, and they were nominally to pay for the war. The reality for myself, for the deputy secretaries trying to to make sure that everybody had the beans and bullets was that without that money we couldn't keep up with the changes that were going on the battlefield. We needed that that incremental funding at the midpoints in the year in order to uh, to in fact fund the, the advantages that we needed to protect the soldiers from IEDs, stay in the fight, and and this was against so-called um, third country, third world. Uh, adversaries. I mean, it's just the reality of the of the cycle times that industry is struggling with today. Most people in industry will tell you they would they would probably expect to keep competitive advantage maybe for 30 months, but certainly not for 20 years anymore. You invent it and 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 get protection. So the reality here is that we have a very fast turnover. It's an information age. I my suspicion is that in context what you will see the department able to afford and what industry is going to start to afford in, in this activity is going to be those capabilities that are platform agnostic. In other words, it's not the platform anymore. Up until now, our competitive advantage, you find a problem, I go build a platform. Okay. Um, we had to do it a couple of times. Uh, the the uh, mine resistant uh, vehicles, the MRAPs, were an industrial response to a $10 problem. Um, we built a million dollar vehicle. Um, it's not where you want to be, but you have to do it sometimes. That vehicle is very disadvantageous from a war fighting standpoint in that it, you know, it locks you up. It, it, it does all of those things. And for about five or 10 pounds of explosive, I need to put about three or 4,000 pounds of armor on. That's not on the, on the side of cost imposing you want to be. Um, but it's the reality that we live with. And so as cyber has emerged in these conflicts and we have used it uh, to the benefit of our forces uh, and moved along, uh, I'll walk you kind of through where I came into the story, um, which was as the commander of United States Strategic Command about nine years ago, um, when the decision was made that we ought to do something with this thing called cyber. And so when that, that usually happens is give it to Mikey, you know, and that happened to be Stratcom. Send it out there. They'll figure out what to do with it. Um, you know, and so a lot of what, um, you know, what I worked my way through was how do you, in fact, organize the department in such a way as to not be so anomalous that nobody knows how to use you. And, and the counter to this was, in particular, where I did not want to be was space. When we put space into the department, we put it in a standalone command. It had its own vocabulary. Nobody knew how to use it. You had to, you know, be behind three or four green doors to even see what was going on. It was a big secret to everybody except, you know, the rest of the world. Um, they all knew we were up there. We just couldn't acknowledge the fact that we were up there, and we couldn't certainly tell our troops that we were up there uh, and that we could get competitive advantage from that. So one of the things that, that I took away from that was, don't let this new idea go off on its own. Make it be part of what you do day in and day out. Make it be part of the existing training regimen that every private and lance corporal goes through in every service. And so the first thing um, was to figure out how to structure a command. We built a functional command around 
what is called a combat support agency. A combat support agency is an agency that has dual capability from the standpoint of departments. So in the case of NSA, they work both for the Department of Defense and for the DNI. That way, you can basically leverage in both directions the capabilities that they had. We both have funding authority, acquisition authority, requirements authorities vested inside of NSA. NSA is the nexus between high-power computing, cryptology, and mathematicians. That's the Internet. At the end of the day, that's the Internet. There's no place else in, the, in this country that has that kind of horsepower. So that was clearly, from my perspective, the place to at least initially align the command and, and the capability. And so that's what we did. We built a component to Strategic Command there to do that work and to start to stand up what we knew would eventually be some sort of a command. Um, we worked our way through that. At the time, the NSA was a gent by the name of General Mike Hayden. He was a great partner in this, very intellectual. He understands this environment. He had a staff that understood this environment. So we moved pretty quickly to establish capabilities, both defensive and offensive capabilities, in cyber for the Department of Defense. Fast forward a little bit here, and everybody, of course, now is starting to figure out there's money. If you say the word cyber in the government, money comes. So we started naming everything cyber. Um, I mean, it, it's just people will follow it. And so it was almost like, you know, and it looks like most of the people in this room would remember the graduate. And when the guy said plastics, well, you know, then it was cyber. Now it's cloud. But, but essentially trying to understand how to organize ourselves, we built components. And, and my intent was to ensure that cyber was treated like any other fires. So it's a supporting arm. Uh, you integrate fires. You integrate these capabilities. You don't look at just one. You try to understand how they integrate together, how you get synergy from the integration of those fires. Because a standalone weapon is too easy to defeat. It doesn't matter how great and how brilliant it is. If you've got just one trick in the pony, it's pretty easy to figure out how to beat it. So the integration of fires was critical in, in my mind. You don't ever want to come at an adversary with just one trick. You know, you're not going to just come at them with cyber. You're not going to just come at them with army. You're going to try to figure out multiple ways so that you have at least the opportunity for surprise and for advantage and the opportunity to then take that advantage and have it morph in multiple different directions so that the adversary can never quite figure out where you're coming from. Okay? And so that was important. And this is all really just military doctrine, just trying to apply it to this, this activity. Legally, what we had to do was we had to form service components. Service components provide you capability. So each of the services had to stand up a command associated with cyber. What that did was it allowed us to follow the law and develop because each service not only has the command, but they have the R&D organizations to, to develop capabilities. They have the acquisition uh, authorities to actually pay for those capabilities and then the people to train. That was essential in what you're doing. And in fact, even though there is, isn't a place in cyber, cyber for the maritime, cyber for space, cyber for air, um, all are different. They are, in fact, different. Um, and how you work in them for those domains is fundamentally different for the military. So we worked our way through having cyber components. It's caused a huge amount of conf confusion, unfortunately. Everybody went, oh, what's this Air Force Cyber Command? Or what's this Army um, Signals Command? Why do we have that? Well, that's the law. They have to have the commands in order to present the capabilities to the combatant commanders. That's the law. And so we had, to, we had to stand that up. And, each, of course, each service wanted to say, well, I've got the cyber command. Nobody else needs to do it. That's, you know, it, it, we, we worked our way through all of those things. So today you have each service has a component. They, they in, in fact, train and raise the force and then present the force to combatant commanders. And, and, and that's, that's just in consonance with the law. Um, we have Cyber Command as a sub-unified command today. So we stopped it being a component and now moved it up to four-star level, made the director of NSA a four-star, and made the command there. I don't know how much longer we'll stay with that. Um, the difficulty with that, obviously, is that you're intermixing intelligence and, and uh, defense. And the challenge there is we, we have pretty significantly different missions. 
um, you know, at the end of the day. We work together. We can't work without each other, but we are not the same. Um, and there is an angst with anything that, that you know, is named intelligence, um, you know, for what it could do. I mean, its, it's mission is to give us competitive advantage and know what the enemy's doing. People worry about the big brother aspect of that turning back against us and, and working inside the United States. The, the taxonomy that we built coming out of this then was, was pretty much along standard law. Inside the United States belongs to the Department of Homeland Security. That's, they're responsible for anything generally inside the United States, with the exception, just like in the physical world, of the bases and stations of the military and the routes, whether they be roads, rail, air, that get us to ports of debarkation to leave the country. Those, in fact, are shared assets with the Department of Defense and, and uh, Homeland Security. So in, in cyber, that means the bases and stations and the servers and the networks that are there. And then for the outside of, of the base and station, it is those, those routes and, and uh, uh, wiring activities that take you to the ISPs, which then become the point of debarkation to leave the United States or enter. Okay? At the time, the thought process was that's like a border. That's like a physical border. You arrive there with an expectation that you're going to be inspected. And, and once you go through that point of, of embarkation, whether you're leaving or, or, or uh, arriving, um, you, you change authorities. You either come to DHS and justice inside the United States, or as you leave the United States, you're, you're looking to the Department of Defense to, in fact, have the capabilities out there to ensure the right of passage and whatnot in the common, so to speak. Um, that activity, and there are generally considered four large ISPs that, that do about 90% of our business in, in the world, landing points in the United States, today are configured such that anything that comes in with a domain .mil is pulled off, goes through a cleansing station, and then is reinserted back into the networks and goes to the bases and stations wherever it's routed to. Everything else goes to the ISP and then is immediately distributed. There's no cleansing station or anything else. Now, one of the questions is, should there be? Should we be inspecting that activity? I mean, everybody's got their opinion. I'm, I'm not going to argue one way or the other. All I'm saying is 90% of the traffic coming into this country comes in through those four ISPs. Okay? So if you're going to have a layered defense and clean things, that's generally where you would do it. Now, that doesn't mean that your critical infrastructure is protected. Okay? Because... Everything between that ISP and that critical infrastructure inside the United States is subject to be intercepted. You know, you can stick a computer in there, you can stick a virus in, all sorts of things can happen inside the United States. But the question becomes, should we in fact layer our defenses? And so one of the debates that's out there is, one, who should control that border? And then two, what's appropriate for inspection? You know, um, and that's a debate that, the, that we as a nation are going to have to work our way through. It's a risk-benefit. You know, we'd like to have the voluntariness uh, um, uh, standard apply. In other words, it'd like to be our choice. Um, you know, all of those things technically are possible as a nation. We just got to decide which we're going to do, what we're going to do. If we're just going to leave it open and make it the wild, wild west, okay, so be it. But then our expectation for security of our nation is diminished by that. Okay, if we're going to inspect everything then our expectation for privacy is diminished. So we've got to figure out where we want to be on that standard. But that's a cultural, that's a, that's a national decision that ought to be made by the, by the people, really, at the end of the day. Um, the hard part here probably is the distinction between private citizen Cartwright, um, any company and corporation, and then, and then the nation. And from a national standpoint, you'd obviously like to feel like you want to protect the country as best you can. From a corporate standpoint, um, organizational standpoint, most organizations today know they're being attacked day in and day out. And they know the price of that attack is intellectual capital, um, competitive advantage in a global market. Most of private citizen part rights out there um, may have lost their identity, probably know that they've gotten a virus or two in their computer, but nothing that really raises to the level of saying, yeah, I'm, not, I'm ready to give up my personal rights in order to feel better protected. 
we just haven't seen that kind of penalty for the most part. And so you've got a disconnect. You've got industry believing they're under attack every day, and you've got the individual citizen not, not feeling that threat for the most part. Um, that's probably some of what's contributing to the difficulty for us to figure out this loss-gain benefit analysis that we need to do. We'll eventually get there, hopefully not at a point where it's something more along the lines of a Pearl Harbor, which I think most everybody would like to convince you is just around the corner. Um, so that's, that's kind of the demarcation. Everything then offshore, the Department of Defense's objective is to keep everything in a way game. Um, we'd like to be able to be out on the network, seeing things come to the United States, towards the United States, warning whoever is going to protect the United States, whatever organization that's going to be, it's coming. Configure yourself and protect yourself and, and, and give them a good idea of how to do that. Those are the active and passive defenses that you hear talked about, things like Einstein and HBSS and all these different systems that are out there that are configured to basically protect either your computer or your organization. Okay? And the intent here is, one, is that the nation has finally come to the realization that the system was built on a point defense construct, which there's never been a successful defense of a point defense system. In other words, you can't win with a point defense system. That's a Maginot line construct. And right now you buy, you buy either um, a firewall and virus protection or whatever it is to protect your computer. Okay? But that's it. And so attacking it is a free activity. I can do it as much as I want, as often as I want, and I'll figure out how to get in and, you know, eventually. And the difficulty here is if you think about your computer as a, as a flat surface, okay, and let's just say that flat surface is, uh, is Microsoft, okay, I just keep poking around until I find a hole, which I will, and then I'll, I'll go in. And then you hire McAfee or somebody else to patch that hole, and what they do is they put on about 100 or maybe 200 lines of code, which is normal virus, they'll put about a million lines of code, which means this huge Band-Aid, which is more surface area for me to attack. So I love that. I'm sure they love the business case, and I love the idea of, of, of how that works. Uh, if I'm trying to attack you, because you've just basically doubled up the surface area for me to attack. And every time you patch, you give me more area to attack. I mean, that's the reality of it. And that's called a divergent strategy. It's working purely against us um, and purely in the favor of, a, of, a, of somebody who wants to attack. At some point, we're going to have to change that. But we won't be able to do it until we can start to change the construct and layer our defenses so it's not just the firewall that's being attacked, but every element that in the system, whether it be the, the, um, the uh, supply chain, or the network itself, or the gateways, all of those things have got to get defense. Okay? And those defenses have to become dynamic. Uh, if they don't, you're really just a sitting duck. And I can just kind of pick away at them uh, at will. Um, so think about layered defenses, whether they be active or passive. And the difference between the two, passive is you've got a firewall, I arrive as a virus, if you knew I was coming, you see me coming, and you tell somebody in a report that's published a week or two later. Um, you know, that shouldn't make you feel warm and fuzzy. If you're, if you're more active in nature, then I can send the update to you almost in real time, and if you didn't get attacked but your neighbor did, at least you're protected, and you can start to work in that way. More active in, in it becomes I, I hook myself up to warning um, sensors that are layered and go out on a global scale ideally and whenever something starts to emerge any place in the world that's reported it's immediately pushed back updates are put out and you can configure your network or you can at least shut your network off until you're comfortable that it's going to be safe I mean you have all sorts of choices at that point those defenses that monitoring system is not yet in place that's where the debate is today how active are we going to be allow ourselves to be and can we be active inside the United States, or do we have to be active outside the United States and just report into the United States? Remember, 
more than 80% of all viruses start internal. So all of this work outside the United States is interesting, but the threat normally is internal. Okay, And we often forget that. We, we, we like to go immediately to Armageddon. And the reality is most of the things that, that we have seen inside the United States that have been compromises have been generally the result of really bad hygiene okay, and, and very poor defenses. I mean, company goes out and says, gee, uh, I'm kind of worried about this, this cyber thing. You know, you look like you're a geek. I'll hire you. And, and the reality is you don't have good standards. We haven't put those in place. You don't have an FDIC-like construct where I put the sticker on your window if I know that, one, you follow standard procedures, you update those procedures, that you have insurance against, against fault, and you report them. None of those things happen today. Today, for the most part, we try to make sure that the customer doesn't know we've been attacked for, la for fear of, of undermining the confidence. So now the customer is really left in the position of everybody's attack, and the customer pays. That, I mean, that's really where we've set ourselves up, and we're going to have to think our way through that because it doesn't make a lot of sense as a defense. You'd really like to know what companies are being successful, what companies are not being successful, what practices are successful, who's monitoring those practices. It doesn't necessarily have to be the federal government, but somebody's got to monitor those activities to make sure that you know what's going on. So that's inside the United States. Outside the United States, how to think about this and how we're thinking about this. We tend to think, and this is pure military, tactical, operational, strategic. So tactical is the, is the local fight. It only occurs in areas of hostility where the Congress has declared this is an area of hostility. That's the only place you have the authority to do that kind of work. Okay? So in those areas, if you have something like the fight for Fallujah, um, we'll use cyber capabilities to ensure that we have isolated the battle space and allowed our forces to have the freedom of maneuver, whether it be physical maneuver or virtual maneuver, in order to do what we need to do to, to, to prosecute that fight in a way that is advantageous to us. Okay? And that's done at the tactical level. It's done by tactical units, whether they be Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Okay? Operational tends to talk more in the regional concept. And in the regional construct, we aren't at war in an entire region any place. So you're now in law, if you want to go do something in country X, because you either have an objective there or you're trying to defend yourself, that requires the president to authorize direct action. And the tool and the use of the tool and the collateral damage and all of those things have to be computed prior to, to getting that authority. That's the law. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's an M16 or a cyber uh, weapon, okay? And, and for the most part, you're not going to see DOD doing direct action in cyber. I mean, there's really not very little reason why you would do that with DOD. And okay? we can do it, um, but we generally are not going to. Outside of an area of hostility are standing rules of engagement. So if I am a ship in passing and somebody decides to attack me in cyber, or if I'm an airplane in passing, you know, through international space, uh, and I'm attacked in cyber, what is it I expect the captain or the plane commander of, um, to do? What is it he has authority to do or she has authority to do? Standing rules of engagement. Um, whatever you do has to be proportional and has to be timely, okay? And the rules of hot pursuit are still the same as if they are in physical space. So if you attack my ship, I can defend myself by shutting down my networks and closing off the threat. I can try to determine where the threat is coming from. And I can try first to remove myself from the threat. And if I don't have the ability to remove myself from the threat, then I can respond to the threat. Standard. But my response must be proportional. It doesn't have to be in kind, but it has to be proportional in anybody's eyes. So if you know that it's a server and the server's sitting on a bench out on the beach, nothing around it, you can go, you know, if you can attack the server. Generally, what we are interpreting today to be a logical cyber response in self-defense is to go from, from the offender, so in other words, the ship that's been attacked, to the first place that the attack has emanated from, so the first server. And... And the response has to be today as it stands and the way we've been doing it is we go to the State Department and we say, 
to the State Department, I have located a server in country X. It is sending out a virus against my, my ship or airplane. I would like to give them 48 hours for that country to stop that threat. Because nine times out of ten, it's not the country. It's somebody else. But, but the country has the physical server. Now, we've never had a country say no. And they always get it done inside the 48 hours. And that has been very effective, and State Department handles that. Okay, and there's never been a reason to go back physically after that server, okay, or virtually. They take care of it. It's almost never that country that was really emanating the threat um, from, from an intent standpoint. But that's standing rules of engagement. If, for some reason, at the end of 48 hours, the country elected not to take any action, then we would, we would then hold the right to go in and, without collateral damage, shut that server down. We could not go in and knock the server farm out. That's too much collateral damage. That's not proportional. And we can't go beyond that first step, only the point at which the attack is being emanated on you. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It gets a lot of press and a lot of discussion about, geez, how are we going to do this? But it's not that hard. It's really not that hard. And nations have been very cooperative uh, in this, this regard in helping us uh, work our way through this. Okay, so that's standing rule of engagement outside of an area of hostility. Um, where you see the department going now is trying to, in fact, find allies who come to common agreement on reporting standards. So we are using today, you've heard the construct of the five eyes in, in the intelligence community. They, that construct has a way of passing classified information back and forth. So we are working with the five eyes construct, the nations associated with that, Canada, um, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, uh, did I say Canada, United States, um, to, to exchange information in real time about what we're seeing on our networks. And by doing that, allowing us to then configure networks for something that we're seeing in another place before it gets to us. Okay? Some would say in real time, but at least now the signatures are being forwarded in a, in a descriptive language against which there is a standard so everybody <coughs> understands what it means, number one. And number two, to the extent that you gain that information by some secret source, you're not giving up how you got that knowledge. You know, and that's part of what people are trying to protect is Hey, I got this knowledge, but I don't really want to tell you how I got it, but, it, but it's, it's here, and I'm willing to share it with you. And that's what the Five Eyes allows us to do. If we could continue that on to NATO, you would easily cover 90% of the traffic of the world. And so we're starting to work with NATO. NATO is starting to build a cyber strategy, and that will allow us to build a layered defense that is more global in nature, sea threats emanate long before they get to the shore. And even if, if, if the threat gets to you, it won't necessarily get to your neighbor. And by doing that, you protect a certain amount of the circuits, you have a certain resiliency in the system, all of those types of things. But it is basically along standard law practices for armed conflict, standard practices for constructs of war, and constructs of, of uh, justice type activities. One of the things that people worry about extensively and, and, and certainly talk about are, is the attribution issue. And it's very difficult. And so people go, oh my God, you know, if you can't attribute this, you know, how are we going to defend ourselves against it? Well, the defense against the unattributable threats has long been in, in you know, in, in, in the practice of uh, um, law. In other words, most criminals, you don't know who they are until after they've, they've committed an offense. That's deterrence strategy. You remove the objective as best you can from the adversary. So that's generally done with passive defenses. In the physical, it's done by having standoff distances so bombers can't you know, blow up their cars next to your building. It's done by ha locking your door, um, you know, having neighborhood watches. I mean, it's all of those things that, that make the the idea that you're going to attack somebody, the likelihood of it being successful decreases. Therefore, why would you bother? It's not a shield. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's just a perception on the part. When we went through in the 70s and 80s the hijacking activity, it only took about 20 air marshals on the thousands of flights we have every day to convince most of the people would be hijackers that it wasn't to their advantage to do this anymore. 
the likelihood that they would be caught got to a point where they just decided this isn't the way I want to go at this anymore. The question becomes in cyber, how do you start to really raise that level of deterrence, the, con the uh, idea that it's not going to be to your benefit? Well, the first thing you have to do is make sure that there are rules against attacking and stealing intellectual capital, etc., value on the, on the network. Once there's a rule for it, then you have to be able to prosecute against that rule. Most of those rules exist today. People are working their way through the nuances of those rules, but the reality is they exist. The question is, can you in fact em employ them? Most of the, excuse me, most of the time it's pretty difficult. But if we start to layer the defenses such that you've got to go through multiple defenses, and we start to knock out 70% of the attackers just by the sheer fact that they don't have the intellectual capital or the resources to go penetrate that many defenses, now you've narrowed yourself down to something that you can start to manage which is why you want to get to a layered defense, why you want reporting systems, etc. That's what's important. The longer we as a nation don't acknowledge the fact that we're being attacked, the longer we as a nation don't report these things internationally, the longer it's to the benefit of the, of the attacker. I mean, at some point, we're going to have to change the calculus about how we think about this. But right now, industry doesn't tell you. They pass the cost on to you, but they don't tell you um, because of a lack of, you know, they're worried about competence. Right now, from the most part, the country, the nation doesn't tell you. I mean, it's just, it's a confidence issue. Um, if you thought your bank had been attacked, you know, think about what you'd do. Because if you think yours has been attacked, but the guy next door wasn't attacked, you might move your business. People today talk about um, the, cat the catastrophe of, okay, I'm in cyber and I'm going to knock the electrical grid off or I'm going to take your banking uh, facilities off. Number one, they can't do that. I mean, that's, that's nice, and, and I've seen all the lab reports about I can make a generator blow up and those types of things. Yeah, if I know exactly what network it's on and it's a very pure network and I've got a clear access to it and there's no defenses in route, uh, yeah, I might be able to blow up a generator. The reality of it, though, is that you, tell, you show me any building in this country which the blueprint is accurate. It doesn't exist. Okay? Somebody goes in and changes switches. They change parts every day in large organizations. Those configurations change. Those, those configurations are critical to being successful in cyber. So we're our, we actually turn out to be our, our best defense just because we, we don't document things. Um, you know, networks change configuration all the time. Somebody goes in and slides in a disk and loads a new set of software, reboots their computer. All of those things defe defeat cyber attack. Okay? So our randomness is probably our best defense. But what you could do is take down a bank or a electrical station, and the panic that would come from the idea that it could be all of them is really what they're playing on. That's really what you're playing on. The likelihood of getting it all is, is so low. Um, you know, and even as a nation state trying to do that to you, you know, think there's nobody that's within five years of being able to do that right now. Unless your system is so bad, like we had in the past in the Northeast, where you get the rolling. But quite frankly, we've done a lot of good work in order to prevent that as we go forward. And it's not likely that that's going to happen. But that's not the cyber that did that. That's just... That's just our own weak systems that have, you know, have, uh, have collapsed on themselves. So, so as you look at these capabilities, what we'd like to be able to do is that, you know, I can say this, I guess, now because I'm not in the government, but, but deterrence in cyber. You know, how do you think about deterrence? How do you take the objective away from the adversary credibly and make the adversary believe that in cyber it's not to their benefit to attack? You have to do it through layered defenses. That's your primary approach, active and passive defenses, so that it's very difficult for anybody to play this game. The second is you have to move it to a global scale because this stuff moves around the globe at the speed of light. You can't wait for it to get to the shore and then take action on it. You really need to know what's going on out there. So global alliances become critical in this. Standards by which to report so that you know what you, what's coming at you and that you can pass that information around moving from awareness, which is just to report it, to warning, which is real-time, it's over here, and it's coming this way, 
that's still probably a couple, three years off to get ourselves instrumented to that level. And then to the extent that you can inst take that instrumentation from warning to the next step, which is to say actively, aggressively defend yourself against it. In other words, go out and find where it's coming from and, and do some sort of proportional act against, against that site in real time at network speeds is, is kind of the nirvana that everybody is trying to get to. Okay? And that's still a ways off. It's, it's great to talk about now, but it's not real uh, quite yet. Uh, and we're working our way through that. That sets the conditions for deterrence. Then there has to be a penalty for what you did. There has to be. Um, it doesn't have to be in cyber, but it has. there has to be a penalty for attack. And we have to be able to hold people accountable. We don't have to hold everybody accountable. We just have to convince the bulk of the people that the chance that they're going to be held accountable is pretty high and is credible. Okay? And that's the piece that we haven't done well yet. We haven't built the, la the layered defenses, and we haven't figured out how to get to the attribution issue, and we've shown no penalty for coming at it. So in other words, we haven't dis displayed any offensive capabilities to the public. Okay? And it's pretty hard to convince somebody that you, that you can do something about it when you're not willing to tell them. If it's a secret, you know, it, it, it's difficult. You do not, just like we do in, in the physical world, you don't have to discuss the details of what you can do, but you have to be credible in the fact that you, in fact, have offensive capability. If you can't do that, then there's really still no penalty for this type of an attack. And that's where we're struggling right now in the debate about, you know, should we tell the American people generally what our offensive capabilities are? And those don't necessarily have to be Department of Defense offensive capability. I mean, they can be FBI, Justice, DHS, etc. But at what point do we actually tell the bad guy, there's a penalty here, and I have capability, and if you keep doing this, it's going to hurt. And it's just kind of the basic stuff. Um, and that's, that's the key debate that's probably going on right now is, what are we doing about privacy and the disconnect between the threat that corporations feel and that, that the government feels versus the threat that the individual feel? They're very different, and they aren't correlating yet. And then how do we explain to the rest of the world, anybody who would want to attack, whether they be an individual or a nation state, that there's a penalty for that and that that penalty is real, it's proportional, it will follow international law, but it's real. And I'm going to hold somebody accountable as a nation for any attacks that occur, whether they be to steal intellectual capital out of industry, steal my identity, or steal secrets from, from a government. There has to be a penalty for that. And the only way to talk about that is to also talk about your offensive capability. That should be a pretty good smattering. I'm, uh, and I think I'll probably just rest at that point and... and uh, and let you have the floor. And we can talk about that or we can go in any direction you want to go. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of context uh, in which to then have the discussion about cyber. And if you don't want to talk about cyber, um, I think there's a bill that just hit the hill this morning that has a couple of, of interesting parts in it, too. We can talk about that. Okay. Thank you. Let me open it up to the floor for questions. Back in the back. Uh, thank you. And, and please identify yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm Jacob Bardina. I'm with uh, Truth and Disclosure. I'm with a uh, uh, security, a network security vendor, SonicWall. Uh, thank you for the interesting overview. Just sort of at a high level, from your perspective, what percentage of our challenge is sort of legal and organizational versus what percentage is more of a technical challenge? Uh, most of the challenge out there is not at the technical level. And it's not to say that the technical is easy by any stretch of the imagination. It turns over so fast that it's expensive and it's hard to do. But, but the real issue for the country is much more cultural in nature. Um, it's understanding this disconnect between what industry and organizations feel as a threat versus what we as individuals feel as a threat and then our willingness to give it up. I mean, if in many cases, the voluntariness rules and whatnot have, have been applied. If you log on to your bank, you know that you're basically telling them through the banner that it's okay for them to look in your account, tell you what your balance is, um, those types of things. And you expect that. Okay? 
but you you did that willingly. Okay, the question is, if I put a cleansing station, say at an ISP, do you get to vote every time it, one of your packets pass through there? And probably the answer is going to be no. So what are the rules? Are they kind of like the speed cameras where I only keep the information if you violated the law? In other words, I see you going through the red light, then I'll keep your picture, but otherwise I don't. And can I prove that? And would you like that to be a government organization? Or would you like it to be a private organization? And those are the things we haven't really worked our way through. Technically, pretty straightforward. Culturally, it's much more difficult. Hello, I'm Pete Shutley from Brookings. And my question is, Back in old-fashioned Cold War arms control negotiations, yeah. one could talk to the other side and say, what you're doing here is threatening to me and we don't like it, so you're going to have to control that in some way via a negotiated agreement. And that worked. And I don't quite see how that kind of model works in the cyber world, because who's going to say to the other side, hey, here's my vulnerability and and that's what worries me. You're uh -huh. not going to share that kind of information with the other side. You, I don't see how quite how you can have a dialogue to get to some kind of a international accord to get a control on this. Could you share some sure. thoughts on that? Um, actually, uh, the international side of this discussion has probably been much more open than the internal debate that we've had in the country. Um, and Four years ago, um, to exchange the information between nations compromised the other nation because we did it so differently. For instance, the British had a way of distributing virus signatures to industry immediately that would have compromised our sources and methods if we'd had given them our information. We got that cleaned up. We've gotten that with several nations now so that we, we can do that. Um, the idea of uh, you know, here are my vulnerabilities, as you say, and, and an arms control construct. Right now, it's kind of a standard activity. Remember, before arms control, we kind of did codes of conduct, and then we worked our way up into international law and then treaty activities to, to do that. I'm, I'm not sure we're at a mature enough stage for treaties, but we are certainly building alliances now, uh, alliances that... Um, right now have no basis in law, no compellence, but certainly advantage anybody who's in compared to somebody who's not. And that's likely to be the direction that we head is that if you join this group, your likelihood of protecting yourself is much higher than if you're not in the group. And if you're in the group and you decide to pull out because you don't like the rules, the vulnerabilities that you'll incur are gonna be significant. Um, and, you know, that there were various names other than mutual assured destruction for that kind of commingling of, of capability such that you uh, set yourself up in a, in a uh, construct of an alliance um, as you go forward. My sense is you're going to see these alliances start to move, move out. Most of the nation states feel the threat is greater to them as a nation state organization than it is to their individual citizens which is a little bit different than, than arms control. Um, and so my sense there also is that nation states quickly see that they need to, to band together and that they're better off, kind of like the system of borders, protecting their borders and knowing what's going across everybody's borders and being able to see a threat coming at them than not. But they don't want to give up the rights of their individual citizens to be able to decide whether or not they participate. So my sense is treaties are still a ways off. But the alliance kind of construct is, in fact, the reality of today and is starting to take hold. Uh, in, in the back, uh, there's someone. Thank you. My name is Rob Sheldon from the China Commission. Uh, you mentioned the cleansing stations, and I have a couple follow-ups on that, if you would. Um, First of all, do those incur latency as you as you scan traffic for vulnerabilities? Um, do they search for signatures or do they use heuristics? And can they handle targeted threats versus just um, like like botnet type things where traffic might have certain signatures? 
Yeah. Thanks. Today, they're in the rudimentary stages. Uh, they have signature files, and they're looking to compare those signatures, and they do it generally in real time, close enough that, it, that it, the delay is insignificant. Um, the question, you know, as we grow those is, in fact, to start to, to get to more predictive activities, to get to more informed, in other words, being fed by sensor nets and whatnot. All of that stuff is, is likely to come forward. Um, those are at the ISPs. To the extent that the nation decides to move in a direction where, say, we put those kinds of, of stations also at the, let's say, the power grid, um, which is a logical thing to do because all you've done is clean it out coming into the United States. It doesn't mean that inside the United States you haven't had viruses introduced, which is highly likely. And so there's got to be another layer, whether, whether we do that at critical infrastructure or whether we do it in localities like, say, for a city or for a, you know, um, some sort of an area construct, that hasn't been thought through. I mean, there are ideas out there, but again, it's difficult to deploy them until you understand the law and how we're going to you know, interpret the law from the standpoint of privacy, and et cetera, and whether those have to be fundamentally different than what you do outside the United States. That hasn't been worked through. Hi, I'm Nancy Iowa with the Department of Homeland Security Office of Inspector General, and I'm wondering. You didn't. We didn't really talk about oversight, but um, with the Inspector General, I'm wondering if there, if you could say some words about your thoughts on on the um, what the oversight community, in particular the DHS OIG, could do, or maybe DOD OIG could do to to work with components in this issue. Yeah. If you if it could help, and and if so, how? Yeah, I mean, for DOD, it's particularly important because we'll probably do most of our activity outside the United States. For DHS, um, we've got to come to the understanding of, do you want a government agency doing certain things and then a non-governmental agency doing other things? And then what's the oversight protocols that you would put in place in order to make sure that those things that are governmental by, by design and by, by a decree are in fact have an oversight body that is independent enough that it convinces the constituency that their their interests are being protected. Okay, um, that part of this discussion, and I've sat I don't know how many times with particularly with the DoD IG young people that that are starting to work their way through some of this thing, uh, this this construct. To me, the nation first has to decide how it wants to handle this issue. Um, my sense is, and it's an opinion, nothing more than an opinion, is that there's going to be some, some combination of private versus public oversight here to make people comfortable that their interests are being, in fact, looked after in a way that's accountable. Okay? Whatever the public side of that equation is, um, we'll have to ensure that there's another oversight body, which is obviously the, the, you know, the IG-type function for, for the government, um, that is equally... Um, responsible, independent, all of the attributes that you would look for um, to affect those oversight activity. Um, it also is going to take training, um, and that's that's one of the key issues that we are trying to work our way through now on the DOD side is sending people off to school so that their version or their belief and their vision of, of cyber is not what they got out of the movies, but is, is actually founded in some educational uh, basis. And it's not that hard. I mean, right now we're talking about maybe three to six months to get very comfortable in that environment and then be able to be, in fact, an auditor slash IG type function. DHS in the United States would go, would, would go shut down the server and, and take the tapes and the backups. So if we're taking somebody down internationally, does, does a, somebody wearing an Air Force uniform go into the ISP and, and take down the server? No. With, with no. guns drawn and, and law rocket launchers and stuff? Or is it an FBI working with a, a corresponding police department in a, in a foreign nation? Yeah, generally the way it has been thus far, and like I said, uh, uh, we've not had a nation say no you know, you're not going to, you know, we're not going to shut our server down. 
but generally we'll go in through the le the, the law enforcement side. That's that's the default is to, to follow that protocol. Um, we've not had a situation where, again, where we've had to take any action that wasn't voluntarily offered up to us. But if you were to imagine a scenario where that played out and it had to be the military, again, likely it's going to be something that's proportional. So you can't blow the building up in order to get to the server. You're probably going to go back in there in cyber. That's, that's one venue that is, you know, more reasonable and probably more controllable than, than others. Um, but what you'd really like to have happen is that that nation undertakes the, the activity on their own. And then to the extent that they're willing to do it with us, like say, generally we would like to use the FBI in those cases. You go in and you say, okay, let's take a look at this server. Can we figure anything out from it? Where did this emanate from? Is there clearly an indication that it wasn't from your nation state? You know, it got here by something else. Who owns the server? Who's responsible for it? Where are the files, you know, video, all, you know, all the stuff that you would go through, yeah, and, and follow it through that way. Green sweater. Montgomery Sibley, I'm a student at uh, cybersecurity at UMUC. Regarding Senate Lieberman's recent bill that's been introduced, particularly would you comment on the lack of a kill switch provision and generally any other comments you have on the bill I'd appreciate hearing. Um, you know, my sense is that I can't remember the number of bills that were thrown out there, you know, and they're, they're starting to coalesce. And the good news is um, the Hill is really taking this seriously. I mean, and, and probably if there's anything that in an election year that can be bipartisan, it's been this dialogue, which is good. I still worry that it's, um, it's somewhat swayed by the people in the extreme. You know, um, somebody's going to launch a virus tomorrow and all the electrical grid will be shut down for the rest of our life. Um, uh, mindset and so you know there's some some of that in the bills that gets you a little bit to the extremes I think that Lieberman in, in particular I spent a lot of time there has has thought through that in a very thoughtful way um, the people who are sponsoring the bill with him have done the same so I think in general terms it's moving us in a more positive direction than negative it's probably going to have to be amended I mean there are some technical issues that that probably are not represented appropriately in the bill and, and, and could be a threat and actually could be through the vehicle of a bill addressed in a way that at least tells us whose domain it is, who has authority and responsibilities in those areas. That's a little bit fuzzy in some of, those, uh, in some of the bill, but I think generally it's moving us in the right direction. Uh, now, I, you know, to me that's... Um, that's an imaginary thing. Um, I think we threw the kill switch, and I can't remember how many countries um, in Arab Spring. It, it just, I mean, when you've got the ability, particularly in the wireless world, um, to bypass this stuff and with satellites and everything else that are out there, um, I, I'd be the first to tell you from an offensive standpoint, nobody's going to shut the network off to, to your access. Uh, quite frankly, that's... It's a nice idea. It, in fact, will drastically reduce, but it doesn't kill anything completely. I mean, I I can remember as a as a young officer, you know, on my visit to foreign countries, and they would you would arrive and they'd say, okay, here you can't get, you know, CNN on the internet. You can't get this. You can't get that. And then they'd hand you a little card that tells you how you get it. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's too easy. Lian Chiao Han with the Hudson Institute. I have some friends that run some uh, pro-democracy website in this country, but they're constantly under attack by the Chinese government. And uh, it usually it's the DOS domain attack. It comes from hundreds of thousands of servers all over the world. In that kind of situation, how do you deal through your procedures, especially the attack American government uh, website. How do you respond to, to this state-sponsored uh, at attack? How do you deal with uh, this thousands of server attack through the normal engagement, you know, the department, the state department, that type of uh, sure. procedure? Sure. It, it's much, much like the scenario that I offered up about uh, hijacking airplanes. You're not going to go after every single airplane. What you want to do is convince them that the likelihood they are going to get caught and that something's going to be done about it 
is sufficient to change whether or not they feel it's worth attacking. You can't go defend every single server in the world. What you've got to do is convince them that you might be there, okay? And that credible opportunity is sufficient to change whether or not they think it's worth coming after. I, I won't comment on nation state. I mean, you know, I, I don't know the scenario that, that well here, but, but the idea of a proliferating attack is a real idea. I mean, that that's not that hard to do. You saw that um, with Inspire Magazine, where they moved it all over the world to, to, to make sure that it got out to everybody. And the question becomes, in those kinds of scenarios, do you, in fact, have to defend every point of presence? Or can you go after a few that you select to convince the people that it's not worth doing what they're doing? That, I mean, at the end of the day, is where you're actually trying to get to. Anybody, somebody? Adam Mack, I work for the uh, Department of Homeland Security, National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. And I was wondering how would the government best uh, build a culture of trust when it comes to information sharing with the private sector? Yeah, I think that's the big issue out there is how do you, how do you in fact, convince particularly the average citizen? I mean, that's, it's not the corporation side of the equation that you're really targeting there. It's the, it's the individual American. And that, I think that, you know, as I said up here, is I think that it's going to end up being something that has a certain responsibility on the part of the government for, for certain elements of, of the security, and some that's going to be on the part of some sort of public-private activity that is accountable in a way, in some way, to the individual taxpayer, so to speak. Um, all government is probably not going to build the trust that you want to have no matter how good the agency is, um, you know, is perceived to be. And all private is probably not going to make people feel completely comfortable either. So the question now becomes, you know, what hybrid do you build? Uh, I use the FDIC model just because it is kind of, it is a hybrid, and it, we used it to build competence in the banking system. I don't think FDIC is the right organization, but I, I think that mindset of trying to figure out how you do that to build competence and trust, you know, that the oversight is in fact independent and in your best interest, and that you are given a choice where, okay, that agency uses it, this one doesn't, where am I going to put my money, or however you want to think about it. I think that's probably where we'll end up. Let's take one more question, uh, gentlemen in the gray suit here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mike Kraft, counterterrorism writer and, and a consultant. I have a, a question relating to the, to the defensive side. First of all, on the interagency <coughs> aspect, uh, especially with Homeland Security, how satisfied are you with the speed of sharing of information on, on types of threats and tactics, et cetera, the interagency coordination? I mean, you have also FBI involved and other agencies. And second of all, you said you, you're not going to discuss state-sponsored attacks, but can you discuss at all uh, attacks from non-state sponsors? Any indication that terrorist groups have been involved in any of the break-in attempts? Mm. Um, the sharing side of the equation between agencies um, is is ever growing um, better. Um, it's not for lack of want. It's not for lack of cooperation that the sharing is not as good as it it eventually could be. It's really more of the technical side of this equation of, of deciding, one, what's the defensive architecture going to be, and then how do I move these, these information nuggets that I want to move between agencies. Today, it's more of an awareness activity. In other words, I detect it over on my system. I pick up the phone, even though we're, we're actually integrated at the op center level, but pick up the phone and tell them, uh, where you want to move to is that it becomes more of a warning scenario where I detect it and it's automatically provided so that in real time something could be done if they wanted to do something about it. Um, and that's where we need to move to. That's that's kind of the next iteration. Um, what's the second part of the question? Oh, nation state. Yeah, terrorist. Um, you know, it's interesting um, in the, in the areas of hostility, we've certainly seen that. But outside the areas of hostility, we really haven't seen much in the way of terrorists uh, getting into the networks. It's not that they won't, and it's not that they aren't there. Um, but you take a look at the way the warfare has progressed uh, since 10 years ago as we started this, which 
at that point, Al-Qaeda, as a terrorist organization, used the networks for recruiting. Okay? And then they did their command and control in a religious forum. And then some of their execution was done through through commands through the internet, but, but by and large it was done in that way. The Arab Spring was was recruiting was done in the networks, but then command and control was done on the network. So there wasn't a bottleneck um, that had to go back to the religious organization in order to move forward. That was the fundamental difference between the two for the Arab Spring. Once, even though without the bottleneck, once they got the information out and they went and executed, they could never come to consensus. So once they won, who was going to be the president? Who was going to do this? Are we going to be... That they couldn't do on the networks. They just couldn't. They haven't found the tool. They will. Somebody will. But but right now, that's kind of the state of the art. The passing of information that gives um, a lone wolf an opportunity to do something terrible. So in other words, how to build a bomb, whatever it is that you're putting out on the network, is probably the worst stuff that we've seen thus far. Um, because it, it basically spreads the intellectual capital of how you can be lethal out to the individual lone wolf, you know, and so, you know, if it's the Oklahoma City activity or whatever, you know, as a comparison, that the opportunity for these people as we move into the 21st century with things like bio starting to become available and the knowledge, that's going to be a real problem for us. How we manage that and don't completely shut ourselves down is, is the tough question. With that, please join me in thanking General Park.